Okay. What if the most simple expression of universal field mechanics, i.e. magnetism, were at the same time both so simple yet so incredibly complex to explain. Human beings only think two-dimensionally. We don't understand what Mother Nature's line is. Most of us, basically all of us, haven't even differentiated out force and motion from inertia and acceleration. We incorrectly call um, net zero force acceleration a force, kind of the force of gravity. That's not a force at all, that's increasing acceleration. It's increasing inertia. It's increasing potential. Any discharge is a release of energy. That's a force divergence. Why does everything follow a curved linear path? Because like the dog on the leash tied to a stake in the yard, every bit of force divergence has a null point or a tether in the inertia that was released to allow it to exist. Now, it is undeniably and absolutely true that 100% of the visible universe is a manifestation only of magnetism. The air in the balloon of everything on the atomic scale is magnetism. Specifically, it's magnetodielectricity. All atoms are little dynamos or little dielectric condensates, so 100% of the volume of any mass is represented by magnetism. But we don't understand what a line is. We don't understand what force and motion is. The actual true denotation of the term polarity isn't even understood by humanity. Well, what does a pole mean? Well, it has two ends, kind of like you have a head and you have some feet. We have a North Pole and a South Pole. Well, that's actually not the case at all. A magnet doesn't have poles. If it did, then you could slice a magnet right down the center like a hunk of salami. It's like, well, here we have, we've cut out the North Pole from the South. That doesn't occur. Everything is simplex pressure mediation. If you use a ferrocell or magnetic viewing film or any one of uh, a Gauss meter, you will see that that null point, which modern science in its vast ignorance calls the block wall, does not exist at that location. It is a pressure mediation. There is no null point between either poles. That is the pressure mediation representing the absolute inverse of magnetism. Now, if we know that magnetism is force in motion, and the null of that is inertia and acceleration, we have the plane of inertia, right? Well, sure, but why can't we denotate what polarity is? Why do we have curved linear representations in the torus, which represents magnetism? Let me press this down a little further so you can actually see it. It's a neat little toy. It's kind of like a visual geometric toy, kind of like a slinky, but not really. It's called a Toro Flux. You can get them for like 20 bucks on eBay. Toro Flux, right? Flux meaning it moves, Toro, short for toroid or torus. You know, why do we actually have curved linear lines? I mean, if we think of a donut, isn't the shortest line from one side of the donut to the other to go simply around? Well, that's the shortest line if we're talking about taking uh, a, a geometric shortcut from the top or the bottom of something. If this represents a mass whose plane of inertia obviously exists at this null point, here's the top of the magnet. Of course, the bottom of this would be the bottom of the magnet. This represents the spatial parameter of the mass, which is the magnet with the field surrounding it. So why do we have curved linear lines tracing themselves from the top to the bottom? Leaving centrifugally at the edge and returning centripetally. Actually, nothing is ever leaving or entering. Everything is a Poincaré disk model of projective geometry. Magnetism itself, and this is a hard thing for people to really wrap their minds around, follows the mathematical model of Henri Poincaré. It's called the uh, projective model the uh, the Honecker uh, model of uh, projective geometry it talks about a two-dimensional line represented in three-dimensional space as it were to be projected out, meaning magnetism itself is a mirage in the absolute truest sense. 
So why do we actually have these curved linear force divergences that are following not a straight line around the torus from one side? Because that's the shortest geometric distance, right? If you look at a donut, if you were to trace the shortest line from the top to the bottom, it would be just directly around the donut, wouldn't it? Pretty sure last time I looked, also airplanes don't travel in straight lines across the globe either. They actually travel in a curved linear path to reach the shortest destination of the, uh, of the, the point of, uh, of uh, travel, correct? I had you actually able to explain the curved linear nature of a toroidal force divergence reappearing. Well, first you actually have to explain what polarity means. It would take me a long time to explain polarity, but in very, very simple terms, Mother Nature doesn't draw a line like this or like this, but she draws a line only like this. But force divergence obviously cannot exist in a three-dimensional object of mass, say a magnet comprised of billions of atoms of neodymium, iron, boron, or samarium, co cobalt, or a ferrite magnet. Obviously that has a certain mass, correct? And since the whole thing, which defines a magnet by definition, is a mass with incommensurable uh, field coherency, because the only thing that defines a magnet is field coherency. This is the only thing that differentiates out a light from a laser is field coherency. That means that the necessity for a mass with given parameters means that the shortest path from curvilinear force vector divergence is a curvilinear path of force divergence. Well, what does that really mean? Why can't we simply go around the donut? Because Mother Nature's line in force divergence is not simply like this. This is force divergence, the loss of inertia. We're only thinking two-dimensionally, like on a sheet of paper. Mother Nature obviously doesn't work two-dimensionally. Magnetism is, by its very definition, three-dimensionality. It's that which gives mass to 100% of the visible universe. So necessitatively, from the premise of Mother Nature, a force divergence which defines polarity, and polarity is only the denotation of the loss of inertia as extrapolated out in a force vector repulsion. Kind of like you say you shoot a gun, the bullet flies out this way, you actually move back. Action or reaction, correct? Okay, so why is there a parabolic flight path to a bullet towards the earth, for example? It takes just as long uh, uh, for a bullet to hit the earth as if you were to drop it from the same height. So you drop a bullet or you shoot a bullet, they'll both hit the ground at the same time. Where, when's in the parabola? What about the force divergence? The answer comes simply, and you have to be able to think three-dimensionally. You have to understand the conjugate nature of what magnetism is in relationship to its mirror image. The mirror image of the toroid, which represents magnetism, is obviously the hyperboloid. Hyperboloid is simply an hourglass shape. So at the center of the toroid, we have a hyperboloid shape, which represents increasing inertia, the dissipation of force and motion, the metal torus, or toroflux in this case, the little device, representing force and motion divergences, nulling themselves out at the plane of inertia at the center of any magnet. So once again, why not to travel directly around the shortest geometric path? The reason for that is, is being able to think three-dimensionally, understanding what a loss of inertia divergence entails, we must entertain, obviously, not a theory, but absolute fact, geomagnetic precession, and the fact that force divergence does not occur merely in this two-dimensional projection, but following, following the Hancore model of projective geometry, necessitatively so, we must have a force divergence that not only extrapolates itself out like this, but also like this. And the shortest pressure mediation extrapolation of a force divergence, which is not only in acceleration, excuse me, in uh, centrifugal divergence to the null point of the loss of that inertia, not only like this, but also like this. And the extrapolation out of this, which is three-dimensional force divergence, which you can see is the hypertrochoidal pattern underneath the ferrocell, 
necessitatively so, that's the lowest pressure mediation of any magnetic force divergence that is leaving centrifugally and returning centripetally, but even leaving and returning is a misnomer. What it is is an expanding bubble of force divergence which extrapolates itself out in the hyperboloid and the hypertrochoid, which is the conjugate geometry of force and motion, inertia and acceleration, or specifically dielectricity and magnetism, not only along this plane, but along this plane. And if you actually extrapolate this out, you will end up with the hypertrochoid pattern that we see underneath the ferro cell, which necessitatively must follow the golden ratio, which must necessitatively follow the path of least resistance to increasing inertia and acceleration. That is why all motion in the universe follows a curved linear pattern relative to a null point of inertia from which that inertia was released. The same as a bullet shot from gun follows a hyperboloid towards the earth just as fast as dropping a bullet will actually accelerate towards the ground. Both are following the path of least resistance in the dissipation of that force vector, whether it's centrifugal, whether it's otherwise, but in the case of magnetism, we're talking about the most simplex pressure mediation in the universe. This necessitatively gives rise to A phase and geromagnetic precession. The curvilinear nature of a force divergence, if you're actually able to create a two-dimensional hypertrochoid pattern on uh, a flat monitor, which you can actually do with various applications, you will see it looks exactly the same. Poincaré disk model. Okay, It looks exactly the same from that top down or bottom up, doesn't matter what you call it, as a three-dimensional projection. The only difference is, is that it must follow the path of divergence of least pressure mediation resistance to extrapolate itself out to the point of increasing acceleration and null out at the point of inertia. Which is basically the short, basically the a complex way of stating the, uh, you know, the larger the house is, the more you actually have to curve yourself around from uh, the front door to the back door the smaller the house is. Also, if you increase that pressure mediation, and this has always confounded people, they wonder why you think, well, a really, really powerful magnet will have a huge field around it. And it doesn't. It has just the opposite. And that seems counterintuitive to a lot of people. It's not the case. Like an N40 Gauss magnet will actually have like a representative field like this. Well, that's a rather large field, but, you know, we could crank it up to 60 Gauss. You know? like an N60 magnet. This is an N40. In reality, when you go from an N40 magnet of the exact same massive uh, dimensions, let's say three quarter inch by half inch, its magnetic field decreases exponentially to its magnetic force divergence. It decreases from that to this, a lot smaller. Counterintuitively, people think they've gotten uh, screwed in paying for more expensive magnet because the field is a lot more shallow. But what they don't understand is what the hell magnetism is. It's like stating, here's, why, here's a really simple analogy, because it's hard for people to wrap their minds around space and counter space. The easiest way for someone to understand it is they think, well, if I buy a bathtub with like uh, a rating of 40 on the flow, which is pretty powerful, if I buy a bathtub with a flow rating of 60, then the volume that comes out must be higher than a 40. In our, our uh, three-dimensional minds as human beings, we think that makes sense. Well, if this is a 40-gauss uh, magnet way down here where the field is pretty big, but not that big, if I crank it up to a 60, it'll be even bigger. But just the opposite happens. In the case of the magnet slash bathtub analogy, when you vastly increase the Gaussian flux, go from like an N40 to an N60, what happens is, in the analogy of magnetism, the drain plug gets not only larger, but also becomes more powerful in its suction. This is a very, very crude analogy. But that's actually what's going on in the magnetic um, nature of uh, the flux divergence in a really powerful magnet. We think of something as more powerful. Like if I crank more water through the hose, 
then ultimately, you know, I'm going to have, you know, the water's going to go out further, it's going to do something bigger. Yeah, and that sort of thinking, we don't understand magnetism. If you understand what magnetism is, that you can't increase the one with also vastly increasing the other. In the case of the bathtub analogy, our magnet, when you increase the flow, let's say you make the faucet bigger and you increase the flow, you have a more powerful magnet. What you also necessitatively will do is create a larger downspout, the actual drain, with more suction on it. And uh, I hear this from people all the time. I bought the most powerful magnet money could buy, but the field doesn't extend very far past the magnet. It's like, it's exactly right. It's the way it works. Uh, some of the Hallback Array uh, uh, magnets, which are pyramidally stacked, the actual force divergence leaps itself from one magnet to the smaller, to the smaller, to the smaller. And it ends up being insanely powerful magnetic field. But its depth is absolutely minuscule. In other words, if you raise the Gauss meter up a millimeter, the Gaussian flux drops off enormously. Because all pressure mediates itself in the null point of inertia. Okay? And when you turn up the water flow, if you will, on magnetism, it's like, well, it's a really powerful magnet. Yeah, but now that the magnet is more powerful, its field is a lot smaller. By increasing the flow of the water, you've increased the drain at the bottom, if you will, the null point of centripetal convergence, the plane of inertia. Field pressure mediation necessitates itself out exactly like that. That is the best sort of analogy that I could think. I can give you a really, really complex analogy, but you might not be able to understand it, so the best way I could think of was a bathtub analogy. And this is not my premise. This is an absolute fact. You can buy two identical sized magnets, one in 40 gauss or 35 gauss and one in 60 gauss. You'll notice that the N60 gauss magnet, its field is really, really shallow. It's very powerful, but because it's more powerful, it's tighter. Much tighter. This is also ultimately what a black hole is, too. Ultimately, when you have uh, an iron core that's so massive, and then it creates a magnetic field, what, <laughs> what happens is, is that not only does that drain become so powerful, it actually overpowers the ability for magnetism to exist at all in the visible universe. It literally becomes to the point where something is so supermassive and once it develops a coherent field, it actually sucks in itself to the point of null existence, wherein we have something that makes no logical human sense. We have something that is A, supermassive, but B, which has no magnitude. And that, to a human being and our stupid, dumb brains, and pe humans have very limited, dumb brains, we don't understand. How could something be super, super, super massive, but have no spatial magnitude? Oh, if you understand how uh, fields work, it is really, 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 really simple. That is what a black hole is, by the way. It's the exact same analogy in like an N40 Gauss versus N60 Gauss magnet. Explaining to you what polarity is takes a lot longer, yet it's so divinely simple. Um, now that I have a complete and total clear picture of what magnetism is, first person on Earth, by the way, you could say someone else discovered it first, but you can't point to any evidence for it because I am the one that discovered it first. I have the proof for it, too, by the way. It's so very simple, and yet at the same time so incredibly complex to explain to somebody else. It's, it's so simple. It can't even exist any other way, but explaining it is righteously difficult. But it is the absolute pinnacle of simplicity. It is like the paramount uh, cornerstone of Occam's razor so far as simplicity. It couldn't even exist any other way. Force and motion, inertia and acceleration, everything's pressure mediation. What's pressure mediation mean? Well, do you know what water flows downhill means? Yeah, well, there's pressure mediation. <laughs> anyway, thanks for watching. I wish I could explain. I mean, I could talk about this for hours and hours, but people, people would just go. <laughs> thanks.